In this video, we're going to discuss the self and communication and how they relate. So I want to start off by differentiating between self-concept and self-esteem. So when we say the self, these are two major concepts, but they are a little bit different. So when we think about self-concept, we want to be sure um, that, we're, that we're placing it accurately. So first of all, just for a few seconds here, I want you to just take a second and write down or think about five to seven things that you would say are true about you. So things that uh, apply to you, that things that if somebody were to ask you to describe yourself, you would say, these are five to seven things that apply to me. That's really what we're getting at with your self-concept. Your self-concept is a relatively stable set of values that you hold to be true about yourself. So these things, the way that you see yourself is your self-concept. So um, it's, again, the relatively stable set of, of, of values and, and things that you hold to be true about yourself. So that's your self-concept, and that differentiates from your self-esteem then in this way. If we were to talk about your self-esteem, we would say those five to seven things you just wrote down, uh, how do you feel about those things? That's your self-esteem then. So self-esteem is not just how you think about yourself, but it's how you feel about yourself. If you one of those things that you said about yourself is that uh, I'm tall, then self-esteem, that would be your self-concept, saying I'm tall. Self-esteem then would say, I'm tall and I feel good about that. I like that I'm tall. I like my height. Or I feel awkward that I'm this tall. I don't like being this tall or whatever. Uh, you know, how you feel about yourself then, about those things would be your self-esteem. Okay, is it positive, negative, whatever? That's your self-esteem. So that's the difference between your self-concept and your self-esteem. So I want to spend a minute though talking about where all this comes from. Where does our self-concept come from? How does it develop? Well, one major factor is our personality and our biology. Just these things we're born with. We're born with these genetics. Some of us are, are shy. Some of us are outgoing and different things like that. And it doesn't you know, always hold true and it doesn't have to always hold true. But, but we're born with these certain tendencies, so to speak. And it's just part of our biology. And that's our self-concept. And, and, and so, you know, if you're you know, maybe you were born a basically happy person or a, or kind of a basically sour person. It just depends, you know, on your personality and your biology. Uh, that's part of your self-concept, and your self-concept then develops out of your personality and your biology in some ways, in, in many significant ways. So, but we also have this very powerful force called reflected appraisal, and and reflected appraisal is essentially if we were kind of looking at a mirror, how what would we see about ourselves? But we're not looking at a mirror; we're looking at other people to mirror how we see ourselves. So uh, what we really are talking about here are what we call significant others. And so significant others are just people whose opinion and uh, that we especially value and we really trust what they're saying and, and that we really value and, and holds a lot of uh, meaning for us. What they're saying and, and, and how they're saying it uh, holds a lot of meaning for us. So, um, so we're thinking here about you know, people like your parents, your immediate family members, your very, very close friends, your other relatives, and people who's, uh, who really have your trust and your admiration. And so what do they say about you? Did they say you're a good person? Did they say you're smart? Did they say you're dumb? Did they say you're able to accomplish things? That holds a particular power for us in this idea of reflected appraisal. So we really get a lot of who we are from uh, from those around us, from those significant others in our lives. So, uh, you know, if, if all you hear in your entire life is you're ugly, you're stupid, you're, you're never going to accomplish anything, then that becomes a really powerful force if you're hearing that from the right people. If you're hearing it from total strangers, it doesn't have quite the same, I mean, it doesn't feel good, but it doesn't, it doesn't have quite the same impact as when you're hearing it from those who are particularly close to us. As opposed to, you know, you're hearing, you know, you, you, you can do this, you're a good person, you're smart, you're capable, you're good looking, you're, you know, whatever. Th that type of reflected appraisal has a powerful impact as well. But, but, uh, so we get part of our self-concept from this idea of reflected appraisal and those around us and, and how they respond to us and what they tell us about ourselves. Then we also have the idea of social comparison. We compare ourselves to different groups and different people. You know, I was thinking about like when you're in high school and, you, and you're looking at the popular kids and thinking, man, I'd like to be, and I'm comparing myself to those popular kids or I'm comparing myself to the most athletic kids or comparing myself to whoever. We compare ourselves to these social groups as well. And that's not entirely, again, none of this is entirely good or bad. It just depends. Uh, if, if, I want to if I want to think about myself as a basketball player, okay, and I'm, you know, a middle-aged, totally out of shape guy, so, uh, and I've never had much in the way of basketball skills, except in my own mind, when I made the game-winning shot a million times, right? But, uh, but I don't have much basketball skill, skill myself. So comparing myself to, to, uh, to LeBron James and other, you know, NBA players, is that a realistic comparison point for me, for social comparison? Probably not. A more realistic comparison point for me 
would be, you know, old guys playing uh, some pickup ball and, and he, you know, huffing and puffing the whole time. That would be a better social comparison group for me. But, but we don't always pick the best social comparison groups, do we? We sometimes get kind of off track in that regard. So, uh, but it comes from those social comparisons too. Our self-concept does. And then our culture and gender roles. How do we see ourselves fitting in with what uh, what all we see going on in our culture and those around us, and and in what what our perceived gender roles are? Are we fitting into those things? Are we fitting into those categories appropriately? Uh, that's another avenue of self-concept development. So, so our self-concept comes from all of these things kind of thrown together and put in the blender, and then and then it pops out our self-concept. Then, right? So when we talk about self-concept, we want to know what are some of the self what are some of the characteristics of the self-concept? Well. First, we need to know that the self-concept is multifaceted. That means we all have these these multiple personalities, so to speak, not in a, in a psychological disorder type sense, but but we are a variety of different people. We are uh, all. I'm a I'm a professor. I'm also a parent. I'm a husband. I'm a son. I'm a, I'm a member of my church. I'm all these things. So my self-concept concept is tied to all these things, and and may may rise and fall in terms of my self-esteem uh, accordingly then uh, in these different areas i may have high self-esteem in one area and, and low in another uh, so but our self-concept is multifaceted we have these uh, multiple uh, concepts of ourselves multiple ways that we see ourselves self-concepts are also partially subjective and um, that means that it's not entirely objective it means that we can get things wrong sometimes you know um, at least in part, because we don't have a fully objective and, and factually based idea of our self-concept. It could, it could, uh, we could get some things wrong, wrong every once in a while. Self-concepts are enduring but changeable. And if you notice the, the graphic I have here, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. If you're familiar with the movie Princess Bride, then you know that line very well, and you know that Inigo Montoya is a character in the movie The Princess Bride who has one goal. His entire life, from the time he's like six years old, his one goal is to kill, find and kill the six-fingered man, right? And so, spoiler alert, um, Princess Bride, if you haven't seen that movie, I'm going to give you a spoiler here, so close your ears for a second, then I guess. Uh, but in the end, he does that. He finds the six-fingered man, he ends up killing him, and then his question at the very end of the movie is, what do I do now? I've been doing this my whole life, this is all I am, this is who I am, This is who I'm wrapped up in this whole identity of being... The greatest swordsman and and you know vengeance seeker in the world, and now that's over. So who am I? And so he has to change his self concept and, and and shift his thinking about who he is and what he's going to be the rest of his life. So and that's hard to do because the self concept is enduring. However, it is changeable. It is something we can change. It just takes a lot of work. We also need to talk about in terms of self concept. When we talk about the self, we want to talk about self fulfilling prophecies. First of all, what is a self-fulfilling prophecy? Well, self-fulfilling prophecy is this idea that, that we don't create our own, uh, you know, future. I mean, we create our own future, but basically it says that, that we have these attitudes, right? We have an attitude towards something or about something, and that attitude is going to affect our behavior. It's going to affect the way we relate to that that uh, that scenario or that person or, or whatever. It's going to affect the, our behavior in that situation, right? Our attitude does. We have a good attitude. It's going to affect a behavior in a positive way or a negative attitude is going to maybe affect it in a negative way. But, uh, and then that behavior, though, our attitude is going to affect our behavior. And then that behavior is in turn going to affect, in some ways, could affect the outcome. Won't always and won't always have the major impact we think it will, but it can, right? It can. Our attitude can affect our behavior and then our behavior can then have an impact on the outcome of that situation. So we need to be aware of that. And that there are two types of self-fulfilling prophecy. One is self-imposed that we do to ourselves. It's just in our own mind. We get in our own head and we start thinking about this and we create, have these preconceptions about things and, and it affects our attitude and then that affects behavior and in turn affects uh, um, the outcome. And the other one is others imposed. It's something that somebody else plants in our head. They plant that seed of doubt or that seed of positivity in our head that affects our attitude and then Again, in turn affects behavior and outcome, so uh, we need to be aware of self-fulfilling prophecies uh, as they relate to ourself. So when we think about presenting the self, because we have these multiple self-concepts, right? We, we, the the self-concepts are multifaceted, right? So when we present ourselves, we have really what we call our public and our private selves, or sometimes they're called our perceived and our presenting selves. So we have the the self that we how we see ourselves, and then the self that we project 
to others that we put on this public face and we and we put it outward and, and so i use that term face and that's what we call it. we call it face and face work when we we create this face or we create this this persona of ourselves that that's what we call the face and then everything that goes into that is called face work and we do all that in order to manage impressions we create these these uh, these multi multiple uh, self concepts to uh, to manage impressions, right? So we strive to construct these multiple identities. They don't just happen. We actively work to make these multiple identities happen. Uh, and then we use uh, impression management, but it's also collaborative. It's hard to create the impression that you're the funny guy if all you ever hear is, well, you're not funny. You're not funny. And nobody else buys into that. But if people are laughing with you, then, then it's, you know, collaborating that impression that you're trying to create. And that's, that, that's good for your, you know, your presenting self, I guess. So impression management can be deliberate or it can be subconscious. Sometimes we make active choices about shaping our ourselves, and we do that a lot, especially on like social media and things. We really construct that that, that uh, presenting self. Uh, other times it's less conscious. It's not a not a totally conscious decision. We just kind of are who we are, and that that creates ourself. Then right? when we talk about the self, we also have to talk about self disclosure. And there's a couple of key points about self disclosure. Self things that self disclosure. Uh, is and, and some things that it's not. First of all, self-disclosure has to have you as the subject. Otherwise, it's not self-disclosure. It's others' disclosure, right? So self-disclosure, by definition, has you as the subject. It's intentional. If you just let something slip or somebody overhears it, that's not self-disclosure. That's just, you know, accidentally communicating something to someone else. Uh, it's not self-disclosure. Self-disclosure is intentional. Self-disclosure is also directed at another person. It's not just, you know, written in your diary and, and the expectation is nobody reads it. It has to be intentionally directed at another person. It's also honest and truthful. Uh, okay. So it has to be true information. It has to be revealing information. Uh, you know, it's not self-disclosure when you can see me on the screen and for me to say, well, I'm losing my hair. You know, well, duh. Yeah, no kidding. And that's not revealing information unless I'm wearing a hat or something. Right? So, But self-disclosure is revealing. It also contains information that's not available from other sources. So if it's readily available, other people know this, it's not self-disclosure. Okay. Uh, but self-disclosure does gain much of its uh, its intimate nature from context. So uh, so we, we tend to disclose in, in intimate context, so that, that creates a sort of intimacy surrounding self-disclosure and makes it sort of this intimate uh, thing. There are several models of self-disclosure. Some of them you're probably familiar with, others you may not be. Um, one you probably are familiar with, the social penetration model. You may not know it by that name, but it's this discussed in a very popular movie. If you've seen the movie Shrek, when he's talking about onions and how onions have layers, that's really the social penetration model. It's called the onion model sometimes. So, so what we're really getting at here is social penetration model measures the breadth and depth of self-disclosure in relationships, as you can see there. We, the breadth having to do with the amount of information in terms of uh, the breadth of that information and the depth uh, being, you know, the deeper that information, the, the more intimate that information. And so you have the social penetration model, which just doesn't describe the health of a relationship. It just describes the amount of breadth and depth of self-disclosure. Another model will be the Joe Harry window, where you have these four different windows, and you can see what those are. Hopefully you've done the reading and know what that is. But uh, um, So you have this open area and the blind area, the hidden area, and the unknown area in the Joe Harry window. And uh, these are all areas of self-disclosure, or, or not self-disclosure, hidden self-disclosure, if it's in the hidden area, so uh, things we're not disclosing. Uh, and it's going to vary from relationship to relationship. But it won't always look like this. In fact, it will very rarely look like this. Uh, if it looks like this, this would be something that somebody you're in a closer relationship with, that you have more shared information. Uh, but if it's somebody you're not as close to and doesn't know you as well, it's probably probably going to look a little more like this, where that unknown area is bigger, the hidden area is bigger. So, um, so anyway, the Joe Harry window is a model of self-disclosure as well. Some of the benefits of self-disclosure, just to throw some of these up there, I mean, catharsis, self-clarification, self-validation, reciprocity, impression formation, uh, relationship maintenance and enhancement, and moral obligation. These are all reasons that we self-disclose and, and potential positive things that come from self-disclosure. Although self-disclosure has risks as well, including rejection. Someone may reject you based on that information. Uh, it may create a negative impression, decrease in relational satisfaction, loss of influence, loss of control, or you could potentially hurt the other person. So some things to ask yourself when you're thinking about self-disclosure. Is the other person important to you? Is the risk reasonable? Is self-disclosure appropriate here? Is disclosure reciprocated? 
will the effect be constructive? Uh, and some alternatives, we could be silent, we could lie, we could equivocate, we could hint. 